Hi, good afternoon. Do you Thank you for coming. Just a uh, quick question, sorry to interrupt. Uh, do we have audio? Uh, because I do not hear anything from the speakers. Is that working properly? Yeah, OK. Yeah. Cool. Maybe if you could turn it up a little bit. Is it loud enough? Yeah, everything's fine. Good. Hi, welcome. And thank you for coming. And uh, I'm, I'm really excited to be here today with you. Uh, my name is, is Jan, and I, I, I work with Python. I write software to make uh, our, our hearts function better, to make our healthcare better. So today, uh, I would like to talk to you about a little bit about congenital heart diseases. Congenital heart diseases are diseases from the birth. They amount, the cardiac diseases amount for one third of all major congenital heart, uh, congenital diseases in total. Approximately one in 100 kids will have a con congenital heart disease. Here I would like to show you three examples of, a, of a three different hearts from magnetic resonance. As you can see, these three images are maybe quite different. A heart, is, as you know, is a pump. A pump that has four chambers. Uh, chambers that pump the, blood, the oxygenated blood to the body and uh, the, the, oxy the oxygenated to the lungs. And when that happens, everything is fine. You have four chambers, everything pumps normally. But sometimes uh, kids are born with, for example, only a, a, a two of the chambers instead of four or three of them. In that case, we talk about hypoplasty of the heart. Also, in some cases, uh, the heart develops a, a defect between the chambers, which means that the, the blood that is oxygenated, that comes from this part, from this circle, gets mixed with the blood that should be uh, deoxygenated and coming to the lungs. That means that the, the kid is uh, not having enough oxygen and uh, feels a bit uh, fatigued, tired, and cannot do maybe as much sport. So these images we have managed quite well, and we managed quite well the disease for now. So the, the past century has been quite phenomenal in how we, how we treat diseases, how we diagnose them, and how we do the surgeries. And the survival has grown massively. And um, still, you can imagine that this is quite, quite hard. So this is, uh, uh, our, our hearts are in 3D, and these images are only in 2D. There are stacks of 2D, 2D images, and our eyes can, cannot see in 3D normally, or they see in 3D, but not on a screen. And this is something like what medical students learn from. They have these diagrams, like what, what a heart looks like and how it should be repaired. For example, in the case of the single ventricle, where, where one of the chambers is missing, you, you essentially disconnect the heart, you disconnect the, the right part of the heart that pumps to the lungs and uh, con uh, connect it only to the, to the systemic flow that, so that everything from the heart goes to the body. And the, the, the lungs itself works on a passive mode. Of course, it's not efficient, but it's the only way we know how to make the kid survive. So the question is now, we have these wonderful images of, of hearts in magnetic resonance, computer tomography, ultrasound, whatever you want. But how can we make some planning of therapy better? How can we better picture what's happening? And uh, things like virtual reality or 3D printing might, might help us. You probably have seen on the corridor there's already a pr 3D printed heart. And uh, you might see some more later on. But to do this, we, we have to come from the images to something that is, uh, is a model, something that we can show in the virtual reality or we can print on a 3D printer. And the images are nothing more than a collection of numbers. So, of course, we have collections of numbers. We have machine learning, deep learning, all the stuff that's happening in the world. And uh, how can we make something useful out of that? Well, we pip install TensorFlow and then build some mighty magical large neural network that predicts our meshes from the images. That's going to work, right? You, you put in lots of images and you get back the meshes. So, well, that's uh, probably not a way how to do it. The, the, the model might train, so might do something, but you have no idea what's, what's going on. You have no way to debug that. And, uh, well, after all, it's, uh, it's not reusable. 
I, I suggest instead to, to decompose this thing into smaller modules, the modules that can somehow be reused later on. Essentially the same way as, as, uh, as you write libraries in Python, you write the library for uh, regex and use the library over and over. So why not to have a library that, that can, for example, pre-process the image, a library that can extract the shape from the image or find some landmarks and so on. Well, the advantage of this is that all these, if, if we decompose this problem into several functions, we can test each function. Each function has its own responsibility. And uh, of course, we can also easily inject any other knowledge that we might have that might help our, our models. Well, there's nothing, nothing new, of course. Uh, we connect blocks, make functions, that's like normal programming. But what's, what's, what's different about this thing? What is this thing that I call differential, differentiable learning, differential programming? It's not me who called it like that. And I actually think that this should be the term that should replace the term deep learning because term deep learning is not really useful anymore. What does it mean to deep learn? But what's the nice thing about deep learning is that the, the idea how you can train models. You have some blocks and you know how to train them with backpropagation. And you know how to build these blocks to be trainable by backpropagation by making them differentiable. And this is pretty much it. You, ha you, have, you build blocks of differentiable blocks, you connect them, and then mathematics of, of uh, differentiation will take care of itself. You just do chain rule uh, computation to compute the gradients and update the parameters. So what does it mean to compute the gradients and update the parameters? What is a gradient and what is a parameter? So imagine you have a function, a function, for example, uh, that, that's just a simple multiplication by a constant. For example, uh, a function x, uh, f that takes a, an argument x, and inside of the function you, you do just return two times x. That's a function, but now, uh, what if you would like to somehow play with the two, the number two, so that the, the result matches what, what you expect. Maybe you want to find numbers that are, are four times the input value. In that case, let's make the two a, a, a variable and let's try to optimize for it. And how you should do it? That's what the chain rule is telling you. That's what differentiation tells you. If you change the output by this much, how much should the, uh, the, the parameter change as well? Uh, that's, uh, that's really it. You, you have a function, for example, in this case I, I show a function of two arguments of x and y. The, the function has one output and the question is how you can, how you should move uh, f, uh, how you should move x or y so that the, uh, the z decreases. Well, and then you, you go to calculus and to mathematics and uh, you, you have a look at uh, how you should do derivative of a function of x times y if x is constant and if y is constant and uh, you get the output. So you don't need to know the mathematics itself. It's, uh, it's nice to know, but the current tools do not uh, help you with that. But what you should actually understand is that all you need is a, f is a block. You want to write blocks which uh, have two methods, forward and backward. The forward methods does exactly what the function does. You evaluate the, the value based on the arguments and you output the, the, the result. The backward what, uh, is, is the opposite. You take some, uh, some difference at the output and it computes you how much you should move the x and y's so that the output gets down. And then you can compu uh, concatenate, concatenate these blocks, compose larger and larger blocks. You can define these blocks, for example, in TensorFlow, right? You, as I said, you pip install TensorFlow and you, you start to write like some, uh, some variable, then some parameters of the, of the expression that you want to compute, and then uh, some placeholders, and then you, know, you, you define a computational graph of what should execute at the end. So you first define the graph, and then you have an object uh, that's called a session, and within the session, you take the graph, that you want to run, 
you put it to the session and you also put some placeholder, uh, fill in some values for the placeholders so that you can evaluate what is the value of the total of the graph. Uh, also, that after a while of uh, looking at TensorFlow, you get used to that and you, you realize that this feed dig is just needs, you need to put in the variables and then you run it, right? Well, actually, sometimes you make a mistake and uh, instead of a lower uh, uppercase X, you put a lowercase X and you get quite nasty, uh, nasty errors from that. And it, it's not really pointing to, to the bug itself, or at least not in the first place. But uh, you have to really dig down into the, the, tr the trace to see what's, what's happening. As an alternative to this is what is called a defined by run. It's, it's an approach that was uh, pioneered by Chainer, and a, a relatively old library. And then it was taken over in popularity by PyTorch, and now there's uh, glue on the new kid on the block, which is almost the same thing as the, the other two. Also, TensorFlow is trying to catch up, and they are introducing TensorFlow Eager to do exactly the same thing. And now this thing is almost like what you would write in a normal Python code. You define your variables, your arrays, you define operations on them, and you get the output, and that's it. Uh, the output is exactly the, the, the array that you would want. The advantage is that instead where in TensorFlow you have to write everything at some nodes in a graph, in a computational graph, so for example loops and ifs and fors are, uh, are actually quite nasty to write. You have to write functions like scan and tf while and uh, it's, it's okay, but uh, it's not Python at all. It's actually a completely separate language, separate DSL that's running in some virtual machine kind of, of TensorFlow that you have no access to, you cannot debug that. But here, actually, in, in uh, these uh, defined I run, like Gluon, you do what you would do normally. You just write uh, functions, you do whatever branching you want, whatever looping you want, and you get uh, the output. And, well, you can do a recursion. Well, it's pretty hard to do in TensorFlow. Uh, so if mistakes will happen, and of course, uh, we often mistype, or at least I do, and, but in that case, at least these libraries always give you the error immediately as it happens, not after some iteration of the virtual machine and some uh, really hidden place down the trace. And the really beautiful part is that you can put breakpoints, you can uh, do all, you can use all standard debugging tools that uh, that we that we know of. So Gluon, I picked Gluon. Not because it's new. Actually, it's based on a library that's called MXNet. That's uh, that's one of the older ones. Uh, I I don't pick it because it's uh, any any really better or worse than PyTorch or Chainer. Actually, all these libraries are almost the same. They combine ideas. They they take ideas. They get insp they inspire. Then the the API is almost the same. What's actually the nice about the vision of Gluon that, that they would like to become the API of defined by run libraries. So if some other backend, even TensorFlow, wants to write something similar, it's going to have the, the, the interface of Gluon, maybe. But it also combines what TensorFlow is good at and uh, what the others are good at. Well, so TensorFlow is really good at defining the computational graph and then taking all the nodes and uh, computing which, uh, which node is not useful, which one should be optimized out, and so on. So that's the advantage of having the graph beforehand. You, you take the graph and you simplify it to make the, the, the run faster. And that's what is in MXNet uh, and Gluon. You can, you can do this uh, static, static compilation of graphs as well. And for those who use Java, Scala, uh, Julia, and so on, you can also export your models there. OK, now, if we go to MXNet, uh, no machine learning or differentiable learning library today is, is able to learn anything without computing gradients. So in TensorFlow, you have this operation that computes gradients uh, in PyTorch and Gluon and all the, these others as, as well, because it would be pretty useless without them. Uh, so how to do it? Well, there's nothing really special about it. You just tell Gluon to start recording the, the graph of execution as it's running. 
and the, the recording is happening once you write with autograd.record. And whatever is within that, it records the, the execution. Uh, so once, the, uh, once you record the execution, you would like to compute the gradients, and that is done by first running the backward function on the, on the output, which updates the attributes dot grad on each variable that you marked uh, as that you would like to compute the gradient with, re with respect to that one. So in this case, if uh, x and y are our parameters that we would like to optimize for, uh, we have to first attach the gradient. It's, it's a very cheap operation to do. And then run the operation within the autograd record. And once it's done, if we run backward, our x.grad and uh, y.grad will contain the gradients. Second, uh, as I said, uh, these libraries defined by run are actually quite nice that you can do, uh, you can define you can define whatever uh, structure of code you want. If you want to write loops, you can write loops. If you want to branch, you can. If you want to recurse, of course you can. Uh, and you can compute gradients on, on that. So you can have a, an, a pretty nasty model, and you can still get uh, some gradient out of that to, to optimize for. Uh, the good thing also is about that you don't need to predefine any shapes beforehand. The, sh the shapes of anything are defined on run. So once you do, uh, once you just execute the, the model, once you execute the code, the shapes are set. So how to build reusable models in, in Gluon? For now, yeah, you're combining some, uh, some uh, tensors and uh, you maybe compute gradients. But uh, what is the point, how you can build something larger? Uh, well, there will be no use of that if you could not build something, st something bigger. As, as for example, in uh, libraries like uh, Keras, uh, people were combining some layers of, of code to to do some some more more deeper models. For example, some some models that were learning some something that not were just for example edges, but something like more like if you would look at an image of an elephant, you could start to look at the the, the, the trunk, uh, the, the, the body itself, the, the tail, and uh, for example, the surroundings. But if you would uh, just do something simple, you would maybe use, be stuck at edges. So yeah, you can do sequential. You can just uh, combine things uh, one after another. But what is quite, is probably more beautiful to do is to write uh, things within a, a block. You inherit from a class called block. You define your operations in the constructor. If, if uh, your operations are already existing in Gluon and are within the NN uh, module, then you will get all the nice things like attaching of gradients automatically. You will not have to handle that. And uh, once you have defined all the functions, or you have parameterized all the functions that you want, you, can, uh, you, you have to define the, the forward method. And the forward method is what, what it gets called once, once you do call on your, on your object. And here, it, this thing is where it, uh, the magic really happens. Here you can define any structure of code that you want. You're not limited. And of course, also the, the, the other functions there can be another modules and the modules of modules. And uh, it can get pretty complex, but still it's, it's manageable. As I said, uh, Gluon would be quite useless, or not useless, but would not be that different from uh, the other libraries like PyTorch or uh, Chainer. Where it's, uh, it's getting different is that you can uh, compile your code as it's defined. So once you define your code, you debug your code, you run it as, as, you, as you did, you can put breakpoints, but at some point you decide, okay, this is fine, it works well. You can actually run a, a function dot hybridize on, on the model, and it compiles it to something more efficient, something that actually completely skips any Python interpreter, something that is directly in the, uh, in the code that was written in C++. And yeah, you can, you can really do anything you like. You can mix and match, recurse, loop, and so on. 
the other thing that's nice, so first thing is how you define models, how you can wrap them into something, some nice blocks. The other good thing about Gluon is how you can define access to data. Um, many of these libraries actually ha uh, help you to, to define access by converting the data first to some record array, something that's fast to load. And of course that's good, but uh, you, you will probably hit uh, the wall when you want to experiment with something new. And in the end, if you want to experiment, you have a small data set. The only thing you, you need is to, to be able to access to individual uh, samples from the data set. For example, individual hearts, if, if we talk about hearts. So uh, just subclass thing that's, that's called data set and define a get item and, uh, and len. And then you can iterate over your data set one by one. Of course, machine learning, to make it more efficient, you do have to run the, the computation in batches, and that's where there is another way to do that with uh, data loader. And yeah. So we have a way to define our models, a way to access our data. And uh, now we have to tell if the model is any good and how, how to tell the model which parameters to change, uh, how to move in which direction. And that's uh, where you have to define a loss function. Uh, loss function is a, essentially just a function that is high for a bad model, a model with bad parameters, and that's low for something that's a good fit to the data. And that's all we want. We want good fits to the data so that the model, when it sees a next example that's similar to what it has seen before, can uh, predict more accurately the outputs that we want. There's no, nothing special here. Again, just write a normal Python function. So you define a model, and now you have to train it. Uh, of course, you can, you can do the backward, and, uh, which will compute the gradients, and then you write some kind of gradient descent yourself. Um, that's not that hard to do. You iterate over all the, all the grads and uh, over all the weights, and you just update them based on some rule. But you don't have to do it yourself, that's what the trainer is for, and the trainer is, uh, is running over the set of parameters that you want to train, maybe some you want to fix, some you want to train, and, uh, uh, and runs the optimization algorithm that you would like. Okay, so the, to combine it all, the training loop is we iterate over the batches of data, our x's, uh, which are the, in, uh, the input data, our y's, which are some labels. And uh, we uh, put the data on the context. Context is, is a place where the data, uh, where the thing is executed. You can execute on GPUs, CPUs, on multiple GPUs, on multiple CPUs, on multiple machines even. And uh, once you put the data in the context that you want, you, you wrap the, uh, the, the model prediction and the loss function calculation in uh, Autograd rec uh, record, which will allow you to construct the computational graph of all the elements from the input, from the image, for example, to the output. And uh, once that's done, you, you acquire some loss, some, some difference, uh, some, some, something that you want to minimize because you want your model to be the best one possible. And once that's done, uh, you do trainer step. And trainer step updates the weights with the gradients. And that's really it to, to glue on. There's not much magic to it. That's really just a, tr uh, a library that allows you to construct uh, computational graphs as you run them to compute gradients as needed from uh, once the, the graph is run. And uh, that's, that's really it. But uh, Gluon itself offers you also some nice things like pre-trained models. So if you want to classify your collection of, uh, of pets, you can, uh, you can load the, the data, uh, the, the pre-trained models. Uh, and that's really as simple as uh, those, uh, what, eight lines of code if we format that. But also you can use the features that they extracted uh, network to, you can combine networks, you can uh, mix and merge. So, now we obtain, a, a, let's say, a visual network, a network that is used for natural images. And uh, how can we use this network for something else? So we, we copy the, the features from the 
from the donor network if we want uh, to, to our target and uh, we just append the classifier to that and that's it. Uh, we have now a network that has a good visual recognition but we need to retrain the last uh, classifier so that it uh, applies to our, our problem. So if uh, after after this uh, this talk, I will upload some IPython notebooks, uh, Jupyter notebooks that uh, are for tasks like if you want to color your images, and you will see how simple that is, or how to uh, write the calculator with handwritten digits. Uh, we many of you probably know the hand handwritten digit recognizer, but. Uh, there are not many ways to, for example, sum or subtract those digits, but this, this code will do that. But uh, finally, if uh, I was talking about all the things like how we can decompose this uh, a large model, that uh, this magical TensorFlow model into something more maintainable. Uh, something that uh, would allow us to construct 3D models, for example, for 3D printing or for VR. So we divide the model into several blocks that are trained independently. The preprocessing block, the segmentation uh, block, the landmark estimation, and the view estimation. Probably the most interesting one, inter interesting one is the segmentation, which extracts uh, a binary object from the, from the image, and binary object which tells you where the heart is. The view estimation, for example, tells you how you should reorient the image so that it is presented in a nice way to a VR view. To go just rapidly over the, the different modules, uh, the preprocessor is just a very simple thing that combines lots of, uh, that converts the images to one channel, single channel grayscale images to another single channel grayscale image so that some constancy is preserved. Uh, landmark estimation predicts places uh, where the landmarks of the hearts are, for example. Uh, segmentator is, uh, as I said, it's uh, predicting where which pixel of the image contains the heart. And view estimator, how you should orient the image. Well, once once we do that, we train each model individually, and then we combine it all together. Uh, and uh, then, of, then you can, well, then you can, for example, 3D print the model. So if you love looking at uh, the, if you love training your ML models, and you love seeing how your loss function decreases, you will definitely love to see how the 3D printer adds and adds layers, and uh, it's uh, fascinating to watch. Yeah. Okay, so you 3D print, and you obtain some images of the heart. You might have seen an image of a heart or a 3D print of the heart outside in the corridor, uh, and it's a, it's a very, actually beautiful model. And it's, uh, it's built on some anatomical knowledge. And uh, so, for example, here are two images of two kids' hearts that are made from the images, from the images themselves. So this is really personalized to the patient. You can now imagine that planning a therapy could get maybe a bit easier if you could print several types of these hearts, cut them through, and uh, then decide what is the best way to, to treat the, the patient. And once you have the meshes, of course, you can, you can show them in VR. Uh, today, VR is getting really affordable. Uh, you, can, you can get cheap VR headsets uh, on top of your mobile phones. And it's actually quite beautiful to watch as well, to see to see different parts of the body, different parts of the heart, and uh, get, get immersed into, into, our, into the journey of, through our bodies.
I will not make it any longer, actually. I'm quite excited to hear your questions. Uh, and uh, I just would like to stress that building massive models is not really that helpful after all. If we can build smaller reusable models that we can train independently, that, that we know what the out input and what the output is, uh, we can actually even test that, such as the segmentation model. We know what the input, the input is a pre-processed image, the output is a nice segmentation. If we would run a whole network, a whole network that is uh, taking an image and for example even predicting diagnosis in the end, we have uh, really much less chance to debug what's going on inside. So combining these blocks together actually is helping to, to make more maintainable machine learning code. This is what uh, this differentiable programming is about. You combine blocks and you optimize them together. Doing things in Gluon, for example, helps you also to iterate faster. You don't have to write the different weird loops and ifs. You can just run normal Python code. So you can even divide the, the different parts of your model into specialties. So if you have a model that's, for example, for visual question answering, you have an image, and you want to ask, is there a cat in the image, or is there a, what's the color of the wall? Uh, then you might have a specialist that's for text and a specialist that's for images, and you can combine these uh, guys together. And uh, that's, that's pretty helpful also to make more ma maintainable code. So this whole differentiable programming is not about building things in Gluon only. We actually need a whole ecosystem of libraries that can uh, differentiate, uh, such as uh, PyTorch or Chain or, or, and so on. But also that's what happened to the async, wor uh, async world uh, in Python. Well, now we start to have a separate e ecosystem of libraries that are async ready. And uh, maybe that is just what should happen for us as well. And I'm quite excited to see how we can now have a massive collection of module libraries, pre-trained modules that we can pick and, and uh, combine to, to make whatever uh, our heart desires. Uh, well, I wish you good luck in that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jan. Oh, we're a little bit over time, so uh, I think that we can we can keep the keep the questions for Jan uh, for the hallway track. Uh, so if you can uh, ask them personally, that'd be probably preferable.